December 7th, 1887. As I step back aboard the Bathory, the taste of regret is heavy on my tongue, mingling with the stale air of our cramped quarters. Last night's revelry, fueled by the false promises of payment for our cargo of mushroom wine, now feels like a distant dream, shattered by the harsh light of the Bathory. Groggy and disorientated, I stumbled upon our deck, greeted by the sight of our meager hold. The empty and once promising casks, now a glaring reminder of my own folly. The echoes of laughter and merriment that filled the air have vanished, replaced by the haunting silence of the undersea. With only seven echoes to our name, and barely enough fuel to keep the battery afloat, the reality of our situation weighs heavily upon me. The tomb colonists, with their empty promises and hollow smiles, have left us stranded in this desolate corner of the undersea, with naught but our wits and determination to guide us, as we prepare to set sail once more. Bound for the distant shores of London, I cannot help but feel a pang of despair gnawing at the edges of my resolve. With that steely determination, I gave the order to weigh the anchor, to set our course for London's distant shores, and the promise of safety. And so, the Bathory cuts through the murky waters of the undersea once more, her hull groaning with the weight of our burdens. Should we need to, supplies will be tossed. The difficult decision was made to travel with no light, a daunting prospect in the undersea. Terror would grip our minds, yet our hearts were strong. Harry, our navigator, piloting by chart and instinct alone, we could not afford the luxury of light. I heard them murmuring, the sailors, words of prayer to the gods of the undersea, and, as it would seem, their prayers were answered. The Bathory traveled with no issue. No creatures of the deep or sailors of ill intent emerged. We silently sliced our way to London, and before I knew it, the lights of home were visible once more. Our spirits were lifted, and as the last of the fuel was consumed by the Bathory, she glided into the docks, into the waiting arms of the Ministry of Public Decency. As you see, some things are too illegal for the Customs Service to admit the existence of. The Ministry are here looking for those. I shrug at them, invite them to search the ship as thoroughly as they would like. There is nothing here for them to find. They leave scuff marks on the newly scrubbed decks and take great pleasure in tangling the rigging. They find nothing more dangerous than moldy ship's biscuit. We all let out a sigh of relief. Home once again. As the sailors left, I feared how I would pay for them to return. Among the clatter and the song, I spoke with the harbour master. There was news of a potential crewmate, but without the echoes to employ, I would hardly be able to hear them out. Perhaps my desperation was too obvious as I was approached by an interesting individual. A very fine evening to you, Captain. My, what you might call mentor, is very fond of adventurous sea captains. And he would like to offer what you might call a dispensation, on account that he is so fond of the captains. Behind the blind bruiser, on the dock stands a dray piled high with fuel and supplies. While more than tempted, I knew I would have to inquire further, asking, who is this patron? Is there a catch? He runs a very fine and very liberal establishment just across the river. What is much patronized by sailors and by men of wit and vinegar. A public house. And there's no obligation to speak of. My patron would only hope that you might remember him kindly. And I suppose that if the opportunity should arise for you to return his kindness, then I don't imagine he would refuse your offer. It was too much to turn down, exactly the opportunity that we needed. I would accept the dispensation. He offered a courteous nod. Well, my patron hopes that you find these little gifts to your liking, and he expects that perhaps someday you might choose to call on him at the Medusa's head. Should that day come, we'll make you very welcome and give you any safe conduct what you might require. Good evening to you. He saluted and then left, leaving me with 
ten fuel, five additional supplies, and the suspicion of the authority. We now had what we needed to return to the sea, yet there was still a need for echoes. And I had hope that the Maritime Museum, that the University, may alleviate that. Ah, yes, the scholar whispered breathily. I have a budget for acquisitions. What have you brought me? What little the tomb colonists left behind would surely be welcome here at the university. A lamentable relic. Not a scientific curiosity, necessarily, but something the scholar may wish to collect. Oh, this would be so terribly wasted in ossuary. They buff the cranium with a sleeve. I think a climbing briar rose will suit this one rather well. A yellow rose, perhaps. Thank you so much. Let's keep this between ourselves. It would seem that I had earned more favor and more echoes in the process. And after handing over the second lamentable relic, I now sat with a total of 17 echoes, still an unfortunately small amount. Finally, there was the outlandish artifact, shaped by hands unknown in London. We have something like that, they declare, but not very like that. Interesting. I have some ideas about suitable fees. They pushed 100 echoes across the table towards me. I couldn't quite believe my eyes. It was all coming together. Next on the agenda was a visit to the Admiralty's survey office once again. With word of Hunter's Keep, we had gained new echoes and fuel. Returning to my lodgings for a time, I read of news from home. The Echo Bazaar, the enigmatic marketplace, had increased its tax on love stories. The traitor empress has forbidden singing in the streets outside her palace. The anarchists of the Calendar Council have inexplicably dynamited a drinking fountain. The Ministry of Public Decency has located and destroyed a nest of gallblighter wasps. All is well in London. After leaving my lodgings, Harry reminded me we were still down three Zaylers. There are sensible Zaylers about, looking for a safe run to the tomb colonies. Or at least a sane run to the southern archipelago. I will need to buy drinks and spread around hiring fiends, searching for daredevils. My tall tales find a ready audience. Scarred and seasoned men and women tramp aboard and find places to sling hammocks. For thirty echoes, the Bathory now has a full crew. And while out there, among the good people of London, more coin than sense, I decided to cruise in Wolfstack. Finding sea shanties, fine food, and the warmth of a pub fire, we were able to relax, unwind, and gain more recent news from the good people. And something more. Someone to share a table with. A likely lass. She tipsily claimed to be a spy. Whatever she is, she was easy to like. And when the evening came to an end, we were still together. The next morning, she offered me a pewter locket as I first reached for it. She gripped it briefly in her fist. Don't you dare forget me, she said intently. While still recovering from the night, a strange sight found my eyes. A creature, a blemigan sitting atop splintered crates, clicking and whistling at captains as they come near. It offered a polite bow. As I extended my hand, the blemigan leapt on, its tendrils entwining with my fingers as it chittered quietly. It met my gaze and bobbed its dome in greeting. It's very small. Is it old enough for naval service? I'm certain its moustache has been drawn on in pen, an attempt to look older. As I approach the Bathory's gangplank, the creature flutes and vibrates with apparent happiness. The bosun winces as I bring it aboard. The keen little mushroom seemed a good lookout, good enough. It had made its home on a shelf in my cabin, building a nest from loose journal pages and the engineer's scarf, and possibly a pilfered map. There was an indentation of a porthole on the rim of its cap. Clearly, the creature had been bored for quite some time. I pulled out my second best chart and several pens. The Blemigan squeaked and bounced over. 
Appending an inkpot in excitement, I was ignored for several hours, and once I returned, I found the creature on my pillow, snoring quietly. The map now had three new islands. A note simply reading, Here are lions, and a drawing of, well, it looks a lot more like a vast spider than a lion. Thank the goodness there is nothing like that at sea. Whilst going over our fuel supplies and planning our next journey, a sooth long box remained in our cargo, a gift from the tomb colonists. And on first sight, it looks just like another one of their coffins. Except on closer examination, it carries stenciling, reading Sooth and Cooper, and a handwritten tag, Deliver to Depot A, Station 3. Something to keep in mind for the future, no doubt. But for now, we would visit the Wolfstack Exchange once again, acquiring three casks of mushroom wine, knowing of course we could sell them for a small profit at the tomb colonies. It was menial work, yet it was work that we must perform. With echoes low, it was a reliable source of coin. My adventurous spirit longed to travel elsewhere, yet for now, we must remain close to London. It was no doubt a journey that would begin to become routine. We would all fall into a rhythm, traveling to and fro, working up both a reputation and wealth. I must confess, however, I looked forward to our visits to the keep. Arriving on this journey, the sisters were indisposed once again, yet word of word was enough to lure them out. I had already luncheoned twice with the eldest Cynthia, and so instead sought out the company of Lucy, the middle sister, sunny, restless, and prone to giggles. Lucy leant over and whispered confidentially a complex story about a butler, a pig, and inheritance. I didn't follow all the details of the plot, but somehow the pig ends up in an attic, and the butler in a vicar's bed. Candles flicker, dishes enter and leave, and the wind butts gently against the window panes. By the time the plum pudding arrived, I was cheerful as I'd been in months. There were supplies left over, and our bellies were full. Yet I felt like something else now had its attention fixated on us. We left the keep, carrying with us happiness and full bellies. Yet that happiness did not last long, as an old vessel lumbered out of the dark, seeking our food, seeking our fuel, perhaps even seeking us. Yet, as captain, I would allow them no such prize. The cannons barked, and Harry warned of something swarming close by. Dark shapes flittering over the glassy waves. I called for attention to remain on the vessel at hand, and with three good volleys, we had sent it beneath the waves. Quickly approaching what remained, a cache of curiosities was found. And like our other victories so far, a bolt of fabric was found within, a bale of parabola linen, seemingly common among these pirates. Yet our hopes for respite were shattered, as a cacophony of screeches heralded the arrival of a swarm of bats, hundreds of them. The air was thick with the stench of blood and panic, as the bats tore at the battery's paneling. Their frenzied onslaught, threatening to tear us apart, both ship and crew alike. The thunderous roar of our cannons drowned out the shrieks of our winged assailants. Slowly, agonizingly, the swarm begins to falter. Amidst the carnage, with weary hearts and bloodied hands, we approached what remained of the swarm. Some floated on the glassy sea, where others, little leathery corpses, lied scattered across the Bathory's deck. The air looked at them with curiosity. I made the call. We would gather up the corpses. The creatures were succulent, with stolen blood. Into the pot with them, I said. Those little bones are troublesome, and the flesh a little gamey, but soak them well enough and they're quite edible. Good advice for all aspiring sailors out there. Yet, don't eat too many. They can play havoc on the digestive system. Finally arriving in Vendabite, we approached the Lamplighter's Arcade. Here they sell copper jewelry, 
grimacing little faces and squat rectilinear figures. A tradition from before London, they claim. I parted with a few small coins for a cheery looking thing with an expression like a tipsy bat. Perhaps it shall bring me good dreams. And then to the arcade of size. Here solemn bandaged merchants of the colony trade old cold coins for brighter things. The casks would be sold, and to the Z we would return again. The days would pass far faster now. Yet, as I stood on the bridge, with that likely lass's locket in my hand, it gave me some comfort. A comfort to know that I would not be so easily forgotten. That should I disappear out in this great nothingness, she would recall me. I decided to keep the locket. It is a risk for both of us, as shorebound lovers grow lonely and sea captains die young. The sea air is cold, but the heat of my blood has warmed the metal of the locket. I shall keep it close. The journey back to London was without event. Yet as we arrived, the blind bruiser awaited. Good evening, Captain. What a marvelous evening it is, if you don't mind me saying so. And given it is my impression that you are a obliging sort, I imagine you will not mind at all. And since you are so very obliging, perhaps you wouldn't mind making a little detour via Mount Palmerston with a few articles of cargo. And if you happen to be in the area, the cheery man will of course cover expenses for this trifling inconvenience. I did not know the path to Mount Palmerston, yet it seemed only right that I should repay the kindness that was extended to me. It is, after all, only a trifling inconvenience. If you would be so kind to deliver this little gift to our friends in Mount Palmerston, then they will see we gets to hear about it. When you come back, we'll cover your expenses. Bon voyage, as my aunt, who was French by birth, if not by inclination, used to say. The trifling inconvenience in question was an unstamped crate of brilliant souls. A crate of exceptional human souls. It is never even known the tender touch of the imperial customs stamp. Consequently, it cannot be sold on the open market, and I assure as the hells better not be caught with it. At the Wolfstack Exchange, I chose to sell our recently gathered linen. I intended to seek out this Mount Palmerston, yet still visit the colony along the way. With seven casks of mushroom wine, the profit should suffice. Whilst returning to the Bathory, I discovered a travel writer seeking passage to Gaida's Moor, another location unknown to me. Yet he was willing to pay handsomely for transport and was keen to commission my ship specifically. I welcomed this august travel writer aboard. He shook my hand, his grip distressingly strong. Thank you. It's Gator's Morn I'm bound for first, he said. I hear they are. He hurried over to my stoker, who was carrying his steamer trunk up the gangplank. No need to trouble yourself. Give it here. Remember, Captain, Gator's Morn. I'll pay you 150 echoes when we arrive. I had no idea how long the writer would be with us. Yet, it was only right for one writer to help out another. And then something came to mind. Z Soup, yes, that merchant, sorted from Mount Palmerston. Yes, another opportunity for echoes. And so, we set sail again, with the intention of traveling farther to the north, past Vendabite, seeking this great mountain reported in the north. But of course, I could not travel without paying the fair sisters a visit. And so, in trade of news, I readied myself for luncheon. This time, of course, with the youngest, Phoebe. Soft-voiced, watchful, and unpredictable. She had something of a story to tell. Of two lovers, parted by water, of a raven that carried messages of a fragment of the moon. She beats time on the table as she speaks, as if to a song only she can hear. The effect is hypnotic. My attention drifts out through the skylight of the dining room, to the false stars glittering in the roof of the cavern. I drift like a puffball spore. The undersea shimmers below. Islands lie like mineral specimens on black velvet. 
ships bob like wood chips between the islands. Vast spine things pulse in the depths. There is a scent like the scent before a storm. The storm came, says Phoebe quietly. Everything changed. Somewhere in there, I finished the last course. The scowling maid reluctantly served cheese and batch all of the biscuits. I had gained a memory, a memory of a distant shore. The university no doubt would like to hear of this. That, or the tomb colonies. And leaving, I felt that strange sense again. The sense that something greater was now aware of us. Arriving in Vanderbite once again, I sold our casks of mushroom wine, leaving me with a hundred and seventy-seven echoes. We sought out one that might be willing to pay for this memory I had attained. There was a hollow temple. The image of a long-snouted reptile god still stands in that temple, but now storytellers gather here. They were willing to offer twelve echoes for this memory. Yet I decided it might be better put to use elsewhere. Before leaving Vanderbite, and after conducting my report, we explored somewhat more. I traveled down a corkscrewed street at the twisty tip of an odd little side street. There was a welcoming yellow glow. From the gilt-lettered windows of a restaurant, a sign read, Vengeance of Jonah. A beefy tomb colonist bustled up. A grey moustache poked impersonately out from under his bandages. Come in, come in. It's a little cramped, but much better lit than most places in the tomb colonies. The scents of dishes are multitudinous and extraordinary. Are they good? Well, they might be, I thought. They might be good, but it was difficult to tell. Once the menu found me, I realized I was out of my price range, so to speak. This bandaged cook was no doubt proficient, yet I had narrowed the echoes to pay for even the smallest appetizer. As the Bathory ventures northwards, beyond the familiar confines of the tomb colonies, we find ourselves in uncharted waters. The very mysteries of the undersea unfolding before us like pages in a forgotten tome. Our journey is shadowed, however, by a persistent swarm of bats. Their ominous presence, a constant reminder of the attack we suffered days prior. In a bid to evade the relentless pursuit, we extinguished the ship's light, cloaking ourselves in darkness as we navigated the treacherous currents through skill and cunning. We slipped past the bat's grasp. Our hearts pounded with the thrill of the chase. As we journey further north, the temperature began to drop. The chill of winter's embrace crept into our bones. Along the shoreline, ice glistened like shards of glass. A stark contrast to the murky depths we've left behind. To starboard, a fast-moving iceberg loomed on the horizon. It was unlike anything we had seen. Yet, despite the ominous signs we pressed on, our resolve unshaken by the specter of uncertainty that hung above us. Our destination lied ahead, the port of Wither, a quiet and enigmatic town nestled amongst the frozen wastes. Here, amidst the great stone and closed courtyards, we find neither solace nor sanctuary, but rather a sense of unease that hangs heavy in the air. The people of Wither are a curious lot, their responses veiled in riddles and half-truths, their faces betraying secrets long kept hidden. And so, as the Bathory rests in the harbour of Wither, her hull creaking in the icy waters, we embark, setting out into the strange settlement. Behind the great arch over the bay, the pale wastes stretch, white and silent as the face of the moon. From here, you might almost imagine there was snow. North of the city, the salt pools fizz with unlikely color. The first task, as ever, was to gather intelligence. The citizens of Wither enjoy questions, so much so that they always answer a question with another question. This can make intelligence gathering frustrating. Are you asking for any particular reason? At what time of day? Is that your hat? Might it be six? It, it could be six. Eventually, I cobble together enough implication and supposition to compose a report. And then came the rest of the town. I followed my nose. 
tracking an intriguing smell. Who'll try? Who'll buy? A street vendor turned scubas on a grill. The mixed scents are nothing like anything sold in London. It all looked so strange and unfamiliar. In the end, I decided upon the grilled troglodyte prawns. Huge and pale, and their eyes stare bleakly into mine. But they smell fresh, tangy and toothsome. I walk on, chewing cheerfully. The crew were uneasy, not wanting to remain in the settlement for long. And so we returned to the Bathory, travelling not far to the east. Before the ship's Z-Bat returned news, its shrill call, an indication that it had found something of interest. And of interest it was. An isle known as Codex. An isle of answers. Codex is a desperate caveful of mute exiles and an inexplicable colony of shivering, bad-tempered monkeys. No one seemed willing to speak. Compiling a report would be challenging. The exiles see many come, few leave. Some are even willing to communicate, but their gestures are unfamiliar, their meanings unclear. Even when I can understand the answers, these are answers without questions. As useless as a key without a lock, there was, however, provisioners on the aisle. A sluggish and somewhat hostile merchant squinted at me wearingly. There were few goods of indifferent quality available, few for an adequate price, and with only five units remaining, it seemed wise to buy at least two. Our journey northward led us to a formidable barrier of icebergs, an impenetrable wall that barred our path to further exploration. Defeated, we charted a course to the south, ever vigilant for the elusive Mount Palmerston. As we pressed on through the frigid waters, the Antasy revealed its true nature, unfurling mysteries like pearls. To the east, two fast-moving icebergs, seemingly alive with some eldritch energy, gave chase, their relentless pursuit a testament to the dangers that lurked beneath the surface. One, crackling with strange energies, threatened to rend us asunder with its otherworldly power. The other, while less overtly menacing, harbored a silent malevolence that chilled us to the bone. With my skill and determination, we evaded their grasp, however. Our resolve still unyet checked, yet our trials were far from over. Amidst the shroud of a dense fog, a swarm of bats descended upon us, their haunting cries echoing through the mist like nails on chalk, with nerves of steel and hearts ablaze with defiance. We navigated the treacherous waters, escaping the clutches of our wind tormentors by the slimmest of margins. Even amidst the chaos and uncertainty, there were victories to be won. In a fierce battle against a pirate vessel, we emerged triumphant salvaging much-needed supplies from the wreckage to sustain us on our journey homeward. As the Bathory returned to London's welcoming embrace, her hull battered and her crew weary, many looking forward to spending time upon land. Yet my attention, as ever, was out there. But first came an inspection, thankfully only by the Ministry of Public Decency. We held nothing that would take their interest. For now, their suspicions would drop, yet the crate of souls we carried with us was a danger to hold on to for too long. My first task was back to the university, to the alarming scholar, to share that memory of a distant shore. As I listened, tears welled up in those shining eyes. Or oh, is it blazing? They overflow, splashing onto the desk blotter. Stop! They sobbed at last. This is too, too Beautiful. Allow me to bring them a core of memories. I wish each individual tone recall. In the end, the scholar offered ten echoes for my time, less than the colonists. Yet my favor with this antiquarian was increasing. The Admiralty's office was eager to hear about the ports we had visited. This time, four, each of which would net echoes fuel and favor. After handing over my reports, I was ushered into the office of the mansion's pyre. A cramped room with a vast desk. A man surveyed me across that very desk, wearing dark spectacles. 
I asked what this admiral needed of me. Visit a port, and will be interested in your port report. Visit places of particular interest, and will be interested in the strategic information you gain thereby. We will pay you well, don't worry. We understand that you can't be expected to act entirely for the love of the Empire. His lips curled. What's left of it? I thought it prudent to ask for assistance. The Admiralty could provide a little fuel to cover my costs. For favor, of course. But then there were repairs. The hull had indeed been damaged, and for only twenty-five echoes and three favor, the Admiralty's yard would fix the battery, and so it was done. While not shiny, the battery was as good as, well, when I'd purchased her. Planning another journey north, I stocked up on more fuel, setting us at ten units, and then purchased as much mushroom wine as we could, seven casks in total. Whilst returning to the Bathory, I encountered the air. My journeys on the Z thus far had revealed some secrets to me, and sometimes the best way to extract a secret is to offer one in return. It was a straight trade, one of my best discoveries for one of hers. It's not hard to drive the bargain. She sits back after dinner and tells me, Most people think that the hard part of surgery is finding what's wrong and taking it out, but any fool could do that. A ship's cook with a cleaver can have that part of the job. The hard part is cutting so that you can sew it back up again afterwards. And she demonstrates on a shark fin, leaving it in a better condition than when she started. And with that, we were leaving London behind once again. Our intention to travel north to the colonies, but not before traveling further east. An unknown path that Harry had set for us, but one that I was excited to explore. But all of that would come, of course, after our routine visit to Hunter's Keep. Whilst I would usually gladly share news with the sisters, we had far to travel and we could not linger, not even for lunch. And so we left, traveling to the east of Hunter's Keep into the unknown. It was not long before we encountered trouble. A vessel not unlike the other pirates we'd seen thus far. I did not recognize its make, but I recognized its danger. I stared us northwards, attempting to outrun the vessel. The dark around us ignited in light as a flare burnt bright red above. We were jolted by cannon fire, yet I remained determined. We would not fall here. The battery strained, yet it continued on as another flare illuminated us. Yet we were far enough away to be safe. Escaping their ill intent, shortly thereafter, I was struck by a great light. I had heard tale. I had heard tale of Moody's light. A great beam that slices through the dark of the undersea. There were other vessels here too, ever searching for plunder. We navigated through a fog bank, using it for cover, as our trusty Z-Bat screeched to the east. And then we all saw it, emerging from the fog. Demo Island. A fervid forest of fungus, and sight of the Iron and Misery Company funking station. It was no Mount Palmerston, yet it may offer us some respite.